All right, you guys. So, since I already did, I, I just started um, doing History of Zelda. And um, the whole thing with Nintendo uh, Direct um, pretty much saved uh, the E3 showcase, basically. And then, you know what? They always do that. And I, I wanted to make a video talking about that. Um, but another genre came back and apparently it was a genre that was stuck in development hell apparently for the past 15 years um well 10 to 15 years don't know how long uh, per se but um yeah it's metroid i never played a metroid game ever for those of you who know about it I thank you, you know, for keeping this thing alive because from the way it looks, Met Metroid looks like looks to be a pretty good ass game. It's just that I never got around to it. Of course, I was the I was like I said, I was I was the Pokemon kid. But now that I'm starting to branch out and do other games, um and just pretty much just give other things a chance rather than just do Pokemon all my damn life. Um I want to look at a video that's basically talking about Metroid and the whole purpose behind it. Because I, I don't know much about Metroid. All I know is that Metroid is about a, a, a woman named Samus is going around uh, shooting aliens from, uh, from some other planet. I don't know much about Metroid. I don't. The only reason why I know that that name, Asam, is because of Smash Bros. It's the only reason. But we're going to change that today. So here we go. What makes Metroid a masterpiece by I T O I? A toy or I toy? Yeah. The year is 1979. The horror genre is reaching its renaissance. Halloween pioneers the slasher flick, while The Exorcist still oh, terrifies shoot. crowds to this day. <laughs> We can always understand the power of these movies. A man who indifferently slaughters teenagers, a devil snatching souls. These are some of the fundamental fears of humankind. Yes, they are. This all changed with the release of Alien. From the very first trailer, you can tell this wasn't anything we'd seen before. The advent of Star Wars made sure a space setting could be viable, but this... This was no campy adventure. The main character is Ellen Ripley, a warrant officer who, spoilers, is the only person to leave the Nostromo alive. At the time, it was unheard of to have a strong female lead. Instead of a damsel in distress, you have a rational and resourceful character that was able to survive through her own merit. Now you may be wondering, isn't this supposed to be a video about Metroid? We jump to 1986. Within the past seven years, we saw the new dawn of conventional video games. A huge part of the early years of gaming was to translate the feeling of traditional media into this interactive experience. Nintendo's R&D 1 team created some of the original games for the NES. Donkey Kong, Balloon Fight, Ice Climbers. These games paved the path for the home console market. But most of these games wouldn't be considered more than an arcade title that you can play at home. Mm -hmm. This all changed with Metroid. For the first time, the NES was given a game virtually unseen before. An entire intricate world wrapped in a dim cave atmosphere, begging to be explored with a cautious smile. This game... I'm going to be real with you, it's not particularly fun to get into nowadays. <laughs> As an entry point for the series, it broke new ground that still echoes to this day, but if it's cool to everyone, I'm actually going to start with the pseudo-remake for this title on the Game Boy Advance. That's fine! Funny enough, this is actually the final game R&D 1 is credited for, and as we'll soon see, it's a beautiful revival and finale for such an important group. I'm gonna play it! This video is gonna be covering the first Metroid game and explore the foundation Nintendo set for the next decades of innovation. I'll be creating a follow-up video that expands into where Metroid stands in the present. 
So, without further delay, we begin with Metroid Zero Mission. You want to talk about story? Here's all you need. Emergency! Exterminate! Kill the mechanical brain! So, retroactively, this is the second time you visited the cave planet Zebes. The first being in Metroid 2, but we're gonna talk about the past and the future, you feel me? Anyways, the story takes place the same way the Republic does, by starting the story off with a story told by someone that's pretending to be the person telling the story, or maybe Samus is just talking to herself, who knows? What I do know is that the brilliance of this game is immediate. From the very start, you walk to the left. You see this opening you cannot go through. Jumping over that brings you to a pedestal holding a strange item. Once you touch it, everything clicks. This is the Morph Ball. You can now roll through tight passages, which is convenient because it's the only way to get out of this little outcrop. This is how the game works. Does it make any sense that Samus has to go into a cave to find an ability to be smaller? Absolutely not. But from a video game perspective, it's genius. You can now assume from that, this point on, you'll be looking for new abilities that can actively aid your adventure. Mm. Not to mention going back through this tight gap, telling that you'll need to backtrack through previous areas with your upgrades. This is such a slick move that you can see the same system in basically every opening in the Metroid series. It's here that you start to see the influence Alien had on this game. The cold corridors open with the rocky interior of this foreign planet. Every enemy is strangely smooth with horrible orifices ready to attack if given the chance. And I mean, Ridley, Ripley, Ridley, Alien, it, it's all here somewhere. When you walk into the very next room, you'll notice that there's something going on just beneath your feet that you can't access yet. If you check your map, you'll see that it's not noted in your data, which is a subtle way to tell the player that there will be secrets that you need to keep an eye out for. Also, there's a new addition, Zero Mission, with these bird boys. You just learned about ball technology, so you feel compelled to take a seat. The power uh -huh. lights up and you get an idea of where you need to go next while still lost as to what exactly lies ahead. The spot just ahead of you is a save room, which is a merciful addition to the remake. After that quick save, that's it. The world is yours. Everything we just discussed will be echoed throughout the game in a meaningful and creative way. I promise you. The crabs are easy peasy, but the turtles are invincible. These malicious clams are too high up for your dainty beam to reach, but as long as you're keeping up with the beacons beckon, you'll find the long beam, and just like that, your problem is solved. Sweet! There's a kind of foreshadowing that can only be done in a video game. You can take the same path back from your beam excursion, uh -huh. but there's a new opening just begging for you to see what's above. Taking this will update your map with a green passage. This is new for both of you. Just ahead, you'll find a split in the road. If you take a left, you'll find this room. No information, no explanation, just wonder as to what it means. A lot, actually, but that's the beauty of this kind of foreshadowing. You are able to discover this in a way that feels like your own doing, which will mean so much more down the line. You take a right, no! Boy, I sure hope that doesn't happen again. This is also foreshadowing, but it's much dumber. You'll stumble onto this door that's guarded by a red force field. You can tell your normal shots aren't going to do the trick, but this isn't your only path forward. This lower section may be rumbling, but you'll soon find the upgrade that you need. A new, limited firepower that directly states it can open red barriers. Smooth as silk, you think. Now you can just open the door and jump! This is that foreshadowing I was talking about. While fighting these goosecks, you're bound to notice that just behind you there's a ledge, even though it doesn't seem to connect to anything. Uh -huh. With the slightest amount of investigation, you'll discover that this game will hide helpful content while providing environmental clues to find it. Okay. Now, I won't say that everything is hidden in a creative way, and you'll so just explore. See how was I supposed to find this a few times, but overall it's a lot of fun looking for foreground camo and breakable blocks, handmade for the careful few looking for them. 
So eventually you'll find some bombs and the bird asks you to head down to Norfair. Suddenly all those impassable blocks make sense and we can finally leave the starting area. This is celebrated with a cutscene of a brain noticing your existence. Coming down to a new zone introduces a brand new soundtrack and environment. Each area is themed around a color and Norfair is red. It's here that you'll begin to really understand Lava and her mighty consequences. A little creative platforming will get you to this section. You would think this kind of maneuvering is beyond what should be expected, and you would be totally right. While you can bomb jump to places you aren't supposed to go, it's mostly just a nice touch for veteran players, and as we progress, you'll begin to see new power-ups that make this tricky move redundant. You'll eventually ascend back to where you think you just left, but this is actually a pivotal moment of unreachable content. The music is foreboding, and a dip into the water halts you immediately. You can barely move, and your bombs don't do much. This is another feather in Metroid's cap, a glimpse of a place you cannot comprehend yet. While this may be frustrating, you're bound to make a mental note of this place as it feels unfinished. Remember, all it takes is one item to make everything click. Fighting your way around this unsolved area brings you to a ruined cave with what appears to be a new power-up. This, as it turns out, will only be referred to as an unknown item. Incompatible with your current suit, and outside of breaking these weird blocks, it doesn't seem to help your mission. On the bright side, we are finally on the surface, okay. although bright might not be the word. You sink deep into an ancient temple where escape seems impossible, but this is where you find the power grip, a new ability for the remake. As simple as a ledge grab may seem, this opens up so many possible routes with your new level of elevation. You scour your way to the top of this ancient surface looking for any kind of direction until, like magic, you find your spaceship from the very beginning. We plunge back into the deep, giving this bubble zone a quick howdy doody. It's here that we finally find the ice beam, and now any threat can be a platform. All the seemingly invincible enemies have just become passive aggressive stepping stones. Uh. It is here that I started to notice the music of this game. In full honesty, the GBA has not aged well sonically, especially any bass sounding like it's pushed through a tin can, but it's hard to say anything negative about Metroid's soundtrack. Nearly every song is lifted from the original game, and they could have chosen a better time to start with. Everything sounds massive but hollow. Every song is coursing through the keys you dwell like the stone heart of a mountain. The synth strings flicker through the round hum of the bass, all pushing you to look deeper into the crushing walls of this new atmosphere. Wow. Creed's theme suits perfectly for this section of the game. You feel like you have some grasp of what to do while still miles away from confident. While you may have more options for your suit, this game throws a curveball with the constructions among us. It's these ball launchers and inverted conveyors that complicate the zone in a wonderful way. Okay. It's a reminder of the previous world being technologically advanced yet lost to things like this minibus. But a flustered tentacle is nothing compared to the area's namesake, Kraid. Originally, the fight was underwhelming, to say the least, but this remake made sure to take care of that with the Super Metroid version. Oh, wow. This is your first real- Oh, damn! A check to make sure you have a grasp on the whole jumping, shooting, and spinning thing. Your reward for this encounter is the speed booster. It's easy to get caught up in the pursuit of jumping gooder, but this upgrade is unexpectedly critical. Not only do you consider all the flat land you've seen as possible opportunities to break on through to the other side, but this also comes with a ridiculous ability they call Shine Spark. With this, Samus is able to store the speed boost energy and propel herself in any direction. This is finicky and obtuse and absolutely awesome. The skill ceiling just went into orbit, wow. and people better than me can make this game an absolute joke just from this ability. And as a quick side note, I just want to say I love this room. You jump onto a conveyor and they just throw a thousand bugs at you to make you trip down the lava fall. I don't even know if this level is in the original game, and I imagine they just thought it would be funny to dunk on the player. 
you'll eventually stumble onto the map room for Great Slayer, and I think it's a great addition. They never give it to you too early. They still want you to fumble around in the dark, as that's a big part of magic for this game. Right. But you really reach a point where the adventure turns from mysterious to tedious, and getting these little pushes in the right direction is a godsend. Especially when the path forward is a fake lake of lava. This is a carryover from the original design, and at least they had the courtesy of dissipation through investigation. This kind of content is fine for an upgrade, but Metroid has a habit of ridiculously hidden paths. After finally finding our way back to Brentstar, they reward you with another cutscene. A bird is heading your way and doesn't look stoked. This is followed by falling rubble, which is dirty because they already put you on edge with the looming threat, but at least it shows you where you need to go. Stepping into this yellow facility is your first ability vibe check. It's here where you'll need to use the freeze beam, ball jump, and in a touch of that out-of-bounds know-how to get by. You'll also see how the bugs can help when it comes to the ooze hearts blocking your path. After you pass this environmental teaser, you get your first visible upgrade, the Vivari suit. Uh. Up to this point, you just assume the acid is acidic and there's not much you can do about it. You were wrong. Now that the suit has a tan, you can also enter the sauna, which opens up a lot of those jake rooms. Before we move to the next leg of the adventure, you also need to upgrade your blaster with wave beam. It's such a huge convenience to be able to fire through objects, and invaluable when dealing with the roly polies. This whole section is gross, but in a good way. The music feels like a fever train, and the slime boys aren't exactly helpful. It's deep in the burrow of bugs that you'll find the suspended one. The hell? The fungal veins cutting off the circulation drops it into depths unknown and apparently makes Ridley angry. It's a good thing that we were able to kill that cocoon before it turned into some awful lost thing, right? <laughs> oh no! Outside of the generally disgusting feeling of this whole place, this fight isn't too much to handle. Once you knock the stinger off this dude, you'll get your hands on the suit missiles. Okay. Now that we can open the green barriers, we are free to enter the penultimate zone. They know it's gonna be difficult, so they actually give you an energy tank. Psych! Welcome to the end game, dingus. So you travel through Mario's sewers, wreck a whole crew of enemies with infinite style. You're ready to fight this robot dinosaur. When you get to the boss room, you'll be surprised to see that Ridley isn't there. And in a crazy twist, Ridley turns out to be a good guy and it helps out just kidding. He's swinging his tail and he's <laughs> like crazy. Oh shit! And head on back to the start But before you go all the way back, make sure you check out the new Tumble and Rocks for a secret path to my favorite upgrade, the Super Attack. Now you can somersault all your enemies and finally stick it to the Rock Tower. I just, I just realized where Death Battle got their channel name from. Screw Attack. People love Metroid, yo. Don't ask me how, but when I was a kid, I totally missed this new path and just figured that the Screw Attack wasn't in the game. Which is a shame, because the spin move makes life so much easier. Please, don't tell Stuttering Craig. Remember uh, many years ago when we saw that strange brown room with the closed beaks? It's, it's finally time that we set back, back to finish the fight. fight. The difference between, between your ability then and what you have now is staggering and a perfect example of the game reminding you of how far you've come without directly mentioning it. While well, the world was once huge and threatening, and you've grown so, so much that you feel like you can take on anything, anything. Which, which is why they're about, about to knock you down a few pegs with, with the titular enemy. enemy. First, a fallen, a fallen space, space pirate, pirate, then two, two more, and then, then just, just like that, that you're face, face to face with, with an abomination. They stick, stick to your head and rapidly drain, drain your health. health. Only, Only a blast from, from the freeze ray, ray and a ton of missiles can keep them down, and they are not shy about gripping up on you. Perseverance brings you to our final corridor. No matter how prepared you are, this is still a fight to end all fights. Bullets pierce the air around you while lava rings scorch through your suit. Your reward for pushing through is falling face first to Mother Brain herself. You don't have a lot of options. Two tiny platforms with the brain beam always blasting over them. Two guns and a nuclear donut machine covering all your angles. It's a war of attrition. It all comes down to you. 
everything you've learned, your ability to navigate through tough obstacles, only you can finally end this horrible monster's reign. There's no time to celebrate. The facility is going to explode and you need to get out of there as fast as you can. It's a vertical climb through the starting zone. Everything is frantically oh dissolving, my but God. it's no match for your bob and weave expertise. You make it back to your ship, take flight, and finally call your mission a success. At least, you would in the original game. Remember when I said that this was only partially a remake? This game has an encore. While we're here, let's dive into the rest of it. Oh wow. Just as you remove your power suit, you are struck down by a pack of roving pirates, forcing you to make an emergency landing. You are stripped of all your power-ups and down to an auto-charge pistol. Worst of all, you're right in the middle of the enemy base. This robotic eye does not bode well for us. Naturally, oh, wow. we in a Metal Gear segment. These pirates are no joke, they will kill an entire energy tank in one blast, and if they're on alert, the gates close down, and you are forced to find somewhere to hide until the coast is clear. You realize how far you've fallen when you can't even open red doors. All your confidence is gone, and you spend most of your time timidly trying to keep the alerts to a minimum. It's in this mild progression you'll transition from pirate base to ancient rooms, the same architecture we saw back in the power grid section. The threat pans from roving pirates to searchlights and tattling eyeballs. Oh my Just god! Just looking at the map makes you feel like this is going to be impossible. So much is unknown and all these runes are off the grid. Where am I even going? What am I supposed to do? Uh, these fun questions and more course through your mind as you approach the ancient mural. This triggers a memory in Samus, and she awakes with newfound confidence. Though she really shouldn't, this war ghost is trying to kill us with lightning. After a grueling battle, you finally set the four stones to life. This creates a mirage that blesses us with a brand new suit. Remember all those unknown items we collected? Plasma shot for multi-head, gravity suit for weightless movement, oh. space jump to infinitely somersault. We are back, baby! Will those pirates give you a hard time? Blast them. Oh, we crap! Speed, pick up, speed dash into the water. We power out of the show's own rules like a victory lap. The world is our oyster. Bro! Back at the pirate hideout, we make our way to the hull of the ship. It is here that the game says, okay, yeah, and you're fine with the suit returning. You are early aliens to calm that down, which is fair, but the battle is not over yet. Now, you may think that the final boss is going to be some kind of creature or leader of the pirates, but as it turns out, the final boss is a trial. In this hallway, there is a hidden room covered in triple iron. One false move will close off the energy tank in the end, forcing you to start over. I'm not joking when I say this is one of the hardest things I've done in a game, but that one perfect run makes it all so worth it. How do you do that? Uh, there's also Mega Review. Run it back. We are doing a second escape, and this time it's the real deal. They are throwing everything they have at us, and in the fire exit, it isn't anywhere close. In, in our, our final moments, moments they, they throw, throw two the elite guards as last ditch effort, but we narrowly escape. This guy. This, this guy, guy didn't think things through. through. We, we make a hasty retreat, and the day is finally saved. Mission accomplished. Wow. With that, we end with a rank screen how long it took you to do it, and how much stuff you found. I mean, honestly, 66% is pretty high for me. I'm kind of stoked about it. But let's say you wanted to go back and find every last thing. How can you do that while you're stuck on a godforsaken pirate ship? Luckily, they have you covered with this slick tube. Dropping a power bomb gets you outside, and after a hop, skip, and a jump, you're right back to where your ship used to be. Everything is a cakewalk now that your power's rival god, and leaves the player atop a mighty throne of their own accomplishments. What? With this sweet regard, they what? its final Finale. It's all on one planet? That is dope. Looking back at our time with Metroid is absolutely magic. When you think about how this game was developed in the wake of movies like Alien and 
a surge into 80s action horror movies, there's one word that defines the experience. Control. Where a movie like Alien is about the dread of the unknown and the fear of being unable to stop unimaginable things, right. a game like Metroid is built around the initial cautious curiosity of what lies ahead that is bolstered by the progress of our own control. Ah. When we think about the key elements of a movie like Alien, you have a strong female protagonist pushing her way through a completely foreign environment and secures her survival by creating an escape route. But where Ripley was defending against the threat of the unknown, uh -huh. Samus is actively dismantling it. And in a movie, you can only empathize with the character, but a game is built around the progress of our imaginary surrogate. By diving into the world around us, we gain more control of the powers that be. Our ability to remember unachievable goals, to push through uncertainty and find the tools necessary to achieve these goals is the cornerstone of what makes search action games possible. Mm. And Metroid was able to define this so early by asking the player to find the answer and enjoy the feeling of discovery. Okay. At the end of the day, Metroid is just a game about a lady blasting aliens and looking for things, but told in a way that could only make sense in an interactive medium. And in that light, it's carved a style of expression that will always be with us and in the world of the present. Huh. And this is just the beginning. You have to wonder, if this is such a revolutionary concept, then where has it gone? Well, the future is never as simple as we hope, but everything will be revealed in good time. Hey, this is Etoy coming out of the editing bay. So after 19 years of silence, about 19 years. Uh, okay. Nintendo announced a brand new 2D Metroid game, and it kind of threw off everything I was working on here with these series of videos. But in the most wonderful way, I am extremely excited about this game. And instead of talking about where Metroid has gone, I'm gonna be going over a couple of games in the series, mainly. Fusion, the sister title for Zero Mission, and we'll do a big lead up going to the actual release of Metroid Dread. Cool. What makes Metroid a masterpiece? Thank you, Etoy. Thank you so much for that. You had let me know a lot about um, Metroid that I did not know about. Um, I need to play that game. I need to play that game. I do. I need to play that game. It looks hard as fuck. But I I can play it. I damn sure can play it. Y'all let me know what y'all think down below about this. Is, do you think I should do more video game um, videos like this? Like, you know, like Zelda, like Metroid. Y'all let me know. Uh, and if you enjoyed the video, like, comment, subscribe. Uh, join us like Crime today. I, w I will be posting Patreon stuff soon. Um, probably on Monday. Yeah, most likely Monday. Because I ain't doing nothing Sunday. So I'll just, yeah, I'll, that's what I'll be doing. Um, but with that being said, I'm going to get up out of here, uh, and I'll see you guys next time. Y'all have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe. I love y'all. And I'm going to see y'all again next time. I'm out. Peace.